Good evening. This is Andy Coughlin, and welcome to uh, the Monday Labor Day uh, conference call. This will actually be the very last one of these conference calls. Uh, tomorrow we will begin with a new system where we will have the reports uh, called in and up in writing uh, submitted so you can log in to www.leader.com forward slash LA gov uh, lowercase LA gov lowercase so again that will be www.leader.com forward slash LA gov and uh, Rochelle Misha Duga will send that to you by email and uh, you'll be able to go to that website and click on the report that you want to hear and so our report can our reports can then be called in as updates are available and you all can listen uh, at your convenience and we can deliver the reports uh, at our convenience. Um, let me give you a little update on the governor's activities today. Uh, she went uh, and met President Bush at Baton Rouge Airport about 930 and rode with him to the Bethany World Prayer Center where they ha are running a shelter, uh, met with some of the families there. In fact, she has just returned to Bethany Prayer Center tonight because one of the folks she met uh, had miss, had gotten separated from her son. Uh, we were able to track down her son in Alexandria and bring that uh, young man to her mother tonight, and the governor was over there uh, reuniting uh, that family, and we're hopefully uh, going to be able to do that uh, with a lot more families in the coming weeks. Um, so that was some good news. Uh, in addition, uh, the governor and the president met with uh, the uh, uh, two generals, uh, General Honore of the federal side, General Landerneau of the state side, uh, Secretary Chertoff, uh, and the Louisiana congressional delegation uh, this morning got a security briefing or a situation report on the entire state of affairs. Uh, there's been some discussion about uh, the organization between the states and the federal government, and the, and the president uh, said that uh, General Honore is his general and that if General Honore is satisfied with the arrangements, then the President is satisfied. And if the Governor is satisfied with the arrangements, and her General, uh, General Landerneau, is satisfied with the arrangement, uh, and he's told, and she's told uh, the President that, that she is, uh, then he considers the issue of uh, that settled. And so I think that's a very important thing, because that's been a, a, a distraction in the last couple of days uh, that wasn't helpful. Uh, to the, the main mission of getting the relief that's so desperately needed and so urgently needed uh, to all of the folks uh, in the affected areas. Uh, we also um, had the first day of the uh, Jefferson reentry, and unless some, somebody else has a report with specific knowledge on that, I have heard that the traffic was much less than they expected, at least within Jefferson. I don't know how it was going through Laplace, and some of the other parishes, but within Jefferson, uh, it was lighter than I think a lot of people had expected. I spoke with uh, the mayor of Gretna tonight, who said that uh, there were there were a number of people there. He saw people come in and actually leave, uh, which is what he was hoping uh, for, and it seemed to have been successful. Uh, the first gentleman and uh, the commissioner of the Public Service Commission, Tubby St. Blanc, were down there, and they reported the same, that the traffic uh, wasn't as bad as uh, had been anticipated. Um, Again, let me give you the, the address for tomorrow's conference call, which will be whenever you want to log on to www.leader.com forward slash LA Gov. Now I'd like to ask uh, Colonel Jeff Smith to give an update uh, from the Louisiana National Guard. Thank you, Andy. Uh, force flow continues to build up at Bell Shape Chase, where uh, reception staging and onward integration is occurring. There are 19,000 uh, National Guard troops in the state of Louisiana now, and just about as fast as they flow in, they're being flowed to parishes. And these parishes are conducting search and rescue operations, security missions, as well as distribution of commodities. There is a significant National Guard presence in 11 parishes, and also including the city of Baton Rouge and the city of Lafayette. So the soldiers are on the street at this time in force. And we're happy to report to you that the French Quarter is secure, and we understand that a couple of bars have already opened. Thank you, Andy. Let's 
let me ask, let me ask Colonel uh, Doran, who's been in Plaquemines Parish, to give an update on Plaquemines Parish because he had some good news from down there. Uh, we just uh, took a helicopter in Plaquemines Parish with Senator Landry and Congressman Melanson, uh, Representative Wooten, and uh, uh, Plaquemines Parish is on the ball down there. They're getting things moving. Uh, they uh, they got their FEMA rep. They have uh, New Mexico Guard who are assisting us, uh, helping them out with their security issues, and uh, and things are moving well down there. Parish President uh, Roussel is uh, is in charge, working well with the sheriff and the folks down there to get things done. Uh, they're putting stuff on uh, on the side of the highway, and they're got, got FEMA ready to come pick it up. They're clearing the roads and and, and moving on. Uh, they're getting the medical supplies. We brought some medical supplies down to them. We also stopped in St. Bernard today and, uh, and again, dropped off some medical supplies. As we were there, their FEMA rep also showed up. Uh, also, when he showed up, he also showed up with a big communications van. So we're going to have good communications to St. Bernard by tonight. Uh, folks down there are tired, but they're, but they're doing well. And uh, we're continuing to support them. Uh, we just got to we just got to find a way to get into them over the roads and get stuff to them, and uh, they're ready to rebuild. That's all I have, Andy. Thank you, Colonel. Uh, we've just gotten uh, the Colonel of the State Police, uh, Colonel Whitehorn, to join us. And uh, Colonel, are you ready to go, or you want a few minutes and we let somebody else go first? Let somebody else go. First. All right. Let me let me uh, <laughs> turn to Secretary Bradbury. If, if Jimmy, you can move that mic down to Secretary Bradbury. We've got some. Uh, Extraordinary news coming from uh, uh, the DOCD report tonight. Good. Uh, early this afternoon at the 17th Street Canal, we actually started moving water from the residential areas in New Orleans uh, from a temporary pump uh, into Lake Pontchartrain. So uh, we made considerable progress today turning that pump on. We are about uh, 75 feet from the end of the breach with our road. So we're, we're right now putting road over sandbags, which is another considerable feat. We've also started one of the pumps in, in uh, pump station number six. As you know, pump station number six is, uh, is the largest pump station we have uh, in the city. And in fact, it's probably the largest pump station of its kind in the world. Nonetheless, we've got that uh, one of the pumps running. And the only thing we're waiting on there is to, we've got a concern uh, about uh, pumping too fast in that canal. We want to assure that we don't have scour and breach, uh, another breach on the west side of that canal. So we're taking it a little slow with that particular pump station, but certainly by tomorrow afternoon we should have a good portion of that station on. Um, with respect to the London Avenue breaches, we have two breaches there. We've been dumping sand in the southmost breach most of the day with helicopters. As you know, it's very difficult to get into the London breach or the London Avenue breaches because we've got water on both sides. You, know, you, you really can't get equipment in there like you need to. Uh, uh, we found a way to get in there now. Some of the areas are drying out and uh, we've got cranes and barges on their way to start uh, fixing both of those breaches. As relates to bridges, five of the seven bridges over the industrial canal are operable and can accommodate marine traffic needed to move equipment for recovery efforts. The Seabrook Bridge will be raised tomorrow to the open position. The two bridges we're really having difficulty with, with are the Al Almanaster Bridge and the Florida Bridge. They remain in a down position. Both of these are railroad bridges. Uh, and the issue around those bridges still being in a down position has to do with sunken barges. So we're trying uh, to and we, and we have mobilized crane barges to get those sunken barges out of the way so we can raise those bridges. Uh, work on the Algiers Point Ferry and landing is going uh, to be completed this evening and operational by Tuesday morning. Uh, that ferry will move equipment, uh, material, and supplies between the east and the west banks of the Mississippi River to continue to facilitate recovery efforts. Uh, today, uh, DOTD met with uh, Federal Highway Administration officials to discuss emergency federal funding procedures. We have turned in or are turning in our first set of numbers with respect to what it's going to cost us to get our infrastructure back in shape. And in first pass, just to get our highways in shape, we're talking anywhere from a billion and a half to two billion dollars. 
but uh, nonetheless, we we're trying to accelerate that process and get, get some money in the bank as soon as possible so we can move forward. The status of the road openings and closures has not changed in the last 24 hours with the exception of Highway 61 and Highway 90 going into Jefferson Parish, as Andy mentioned earlier. That's it, Andy. Thank you, Secretary Bradbury. Um, Colonel Whitehorn? I'm doing it now. Thank you, Andy. Good evening. Uh, I just returned from New Orleans, and from what I saw uh, personally just riding around the city and visiting with uh, the many, many, many police officers and National Guard troops and Army troops and, and such as that, that uh, it appears to me that order has been restored into the uh, streets of, in the downtown metropolitan area of New Orleans. Uh, in addition to that, we are now seeing people that were at one time afraid, afraid to come out of their homes are now coming out when they see the police patrols. And I saw many residents of uh, Orleans, just New Orleans, just wandering the streets, uh, but uh, didn't encounter any violence. There was no reports of any violence. Uh, I was talking to the officers there about uh, arresting looters, and there's really no one there to arrest at this point. So uh, no shots were fired, and it didn't... Uh, hear any sirens going other than the blue lights we were using to maneuver through the through the traffic. Our rescue and evacuation missions are continuing throughout the metro area uh, and our patrols are continuing. Uh, the, as you know today we started the re-entry into Jefferson Parish. Uh, at one point the traffic was pretty heavy. We had some backups reported up to eight miles particularly on U.S. Highway 61. Uh, I think the re-entry uh, went as well as could be expected, and uh, right now some of the traffic is beginning to move out. I saw a lot of pickup trucks loaded with furniture and other items coming out of that area. Uh, the traffic is quite heavy right now leaving, but there's, there are no wrecks that we're working, and uh, there is little traffic headed into New Orleans at this time. Um, There was a report today that I saw, uh, it, I, I think it was actually reported Friday in the Times-Picayune uh, that stated that state troopers, uh, Louisiana state troopers were resigning their commissions in lieu of working in New Orleans. And, and I don't know uh, why these reporters will report some of these lies. And the fact is I've got retired troopers coming back to work. I saw one, one of my troopers that was so ill I threatened to send him home, and he told me, Colonel, you couldn't make me leave. Uh, and, and that's the type of nonsense that's out there in the media. We have a total of 843 uh, police officers from around the country as a uh, part of the uh, EMAC agreement, 843, in addition to the 800 plus that we've sent in and, uh, and the other we have some volunteer agencies that have just showed up. Uh, I couldn't tell you the number of police officers down there, but they're running over one another. Uh, so we're going to have to try to get a handle on that now and start stopping the tide of all the law enforcement coming in because we're going to need them for the long haul. We figure this is about a six-month process, so we're going to have to try to figure out how we uh, stagger these officers coming in. But uh, right now, ones that I have commissioned are 843, and that's the end of my report. Thank you, Colonel. I'd like to turn this to uh, Jimmy Guidry. Do you have an update on any of the medical stuff? Dr. Guidry, move that. Please move that mic. Please. Okay. Uh, this, they uh, certainly not seeing near as many uh, people that are being rescued that require medical assistance at this point in time, so we feel like we're stabilizing. Uh, we have numerous medical professionals from other country, uh, other states and other places uh, volunteering to come in here and actually uh, put a database together so that when we do need them, we, we will be able to call them back and say, uh, now's the time to come in here. But right now we feel like uh, we're able to handle uh, plenty of this. We, we do have several hospitals in the affected area that are now back up and running, and their requests for medical professionals uh, to help uh, those hospitals are being met, so we're, we're trying to make sure that the resources that are available match the resources that are needed. And uh, 
we feel uh, optimistic that we'll be able to take care of the patients here in Louisiana without having to send them outside of the state. Uh, we feel like we've really uh, made great effort at this point and are able to take care of those that are here in the, in the report. Uh, Dr. Gideon, I'm going to give an update of, of something I heard in the report with Secretary Chertoff and others this morning, and you might want to supplement it, but as, my, as I appreciate it, uh, there are some joint state and federal and local teams doing some health assessments based on the, the sanding water in New Orleans in particular with regard to mosquito-borne illnesses and looking at trying to identify whether there are mosquito uh, abatement programs uh, that need to be initiated that uh, are more substantial than the usual aggressive Louisiana mosquito abatement programs, which we have a lot of. Um, in which they have in, in, in the greater New Orleans area. Uh, there was some discussion about that as well as other sampling of, of uh, potential pathogens. Uh, it remains a very significant concern of everybody, uh, which uh, is also going to be something that we need to uh, consider as the mayor and uh, folks are, are talking about uh, similar reentry into the area in New Orleans over the, over the coming days. That's correct. The Centers for Disease Control has sent a number of uh, experts to help us evaluate the need for mosquito control and also whether water, uh, how to make sure that the water is uh, where you can drink it again and to make sure that, that uh, in some of the outbreaks of uh, dysentery in our shelters that we're making sure that we keep those under control. And we feel like we have a lot of federal experts helping make sure that people aren't put at risk of uh, infection uh, as a result of this uh, situation in New Orleans and in the affected areas. Thank you. Uh, let me ask uh, the uh, Public Service Commission for a report uh, tonight. And we've got a representative of the Public Service Commission uh, to make that report on progress with our utilities. Please speak loudly. Uh, electric service outages reported by the electric utilities as of $1,700 today. Clico, 72200 Demco, 8,264. Energy Gulf States, 420. Energy Louisiana, 261,812. Energy New Orleans, 200,749. Sleka, 362. Washington St. Tammany, 44,799. There are uh, 588,606 customers that remain out of service. Uh, we've had uh, 310,687 customers that have been restored since August the 30th. The uh, telephone service outages are at 89, excuse me, 895,095, and the gas outages are at 3,000. Thank you very much. Uh, for Natural Resources, a DNR report. Thank you, Andy. Um, a uh, couple of major uh, issues. Uh, the electrical power at key energy locations in the affected area continues to improve, and the assessment of pipeline infrastructure by industry continues as the manpower and the guards become available. Regarding federal oil and gas production, 78.93% of the oil remains shut in in the federal uh, waters, and 57.8% of the natural gas remain shut in in the federal uh, waters. Regarding state oil and gas production, in Louisiana, 50% of the oil production remains shut in. 29% of the natural gas production remains shut in. On pipeline issues, on a, for the loop facility, uh, loop facility is 70% capacity and expects to be at 100% capacity in seven days. We're continuing to work with the Public Service Commission to provide electricity to key areas to improve to um, improve the capacity. Regarding a strategic petroleum reserve, President Bush ordered a release of 30 million barrels of oil from the SPR. As far as refineries, uh, the, of the seven refineries in southeast Louisiana, five refineries remain shut down, and two refineries are restarting. A couple of miscellaneous things. We were successful in obtaining National Guard troops to provide security for industry personnel to ramp up their operations. And uh, that uh, security was provided for a Chevron at Belle Chase, 
uh, Shell at uh, Norco and Convent, and Exxon Mobil at Shell Met. We continue to work with EPA and DEQ for waivers on sulfur limits for gas refining. And we will issue emergency orders to relax the reporting requirements for moving oil when production resumes, and we will issue any additional emergency orders as needed. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Uh, we don't have DSS here tonight, but we do have uh, Vic Howell from the Red Cross for a shelter's report. Vic? Uh, as, of, uh, as of this afternoon, the Red Cross was still operating 131 shelters, sheltering just over 51,000 people statewide. Uh, we served a little over 200,000 meals today and had uh, about 3,000 Red Cross personnel on the ground. And just as the American Red Cross has uh, provided generous support to, to our other countries when there was trouble, today I saw teams from the Red Cross in Canada, Germany, France, and Italy show up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana to help uh, our cause. We're beginning to go through a transition strategy now working with the governor's office to redefine these shelters a little bit. Typically in a disaster of this type on a smaller scale, on a more normal scale, the Red Cross would look at sheltering people for 15 to 30 days. We're now being told that we should expect to be sheltering people for 60 to 90 days. That transitions us to a different look at our shelters to make them more community centers rather than just shelters, and we're working on that strategy with representatives from the governor's office and DSS. And finally, we had an offer today from the International Rescue Committee, an organization that works worldwide, to come in and help coordinate the activity of other non-governmental organizations. We're receiving wonderful offers of aid from many, many other nonprofit organizations, and trying to coordinate that can be quite a task. And we're glad to have the assistance of the International Rescue Committee to uh, help look at that issue. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Uh, we now actually do have a representative of the Department of Social Services, Secretary Ann Williamson, uh, to give a little update from uh, DSS, Secretary Williamson. Great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, why don't I do this? Sure. Well, the Secretary is doing uh, an update. Uh, I've got an economic development update. Uh, the governor, uh, when she met with the president today, uh, while well, recognizing that we are still very much in the search and rescue phase, uh, in the evacuation phase, and the relocation phase, uh, we also need to start thinking about the rebuilding phase for Louisiana. And she uh, gave the president a letter in which she suggested that uh, uh, the president and the governor together uh, appoint a council to provide some leadership in the area of restoring uh, Louisiana's infrastructure and rebuilding its economy. Uh, we want to make sure that, that we take care of that, address coastal restoration and environmental damage, and restore the cultural fabric of the impacted region uh, and, and recreate uh, one of the most uh, uh, notable and greatest cities in the world, as well as the surrounding areas, which have great cultural assets as well. Uh, each of the parishes that was severely impacted has unique characteristics that need to be restored uh, in order for our state to reestablish itself uh, with the kind of energy and vision that we need to, to succeed and rebuild our way through uh, for the future. Uh, we're going to reestablish Louisiana as a global leader in energy production, in shipping, in manufacturing, in tourism, in technology industries, and she laid out uh, some strategies uh, for the president to consider for uh, those areas. And so that's something that we hope to begin working on uh, with a broad-based group of stakeholders from around the state in particular, but also uh, we've got an opportunity to get some of the best ideas from around the country and around the world, and we're hoping to engage uh, good thinkers uh, to help uh, Louisianans uh, create the kind of vision that we want for uh, turning uh, you know, the, the devastation that we face uh, into an opportunity to honor those uh, who have been so uh, impacted uh, by the storm uh, through the, the, the loss of loved ones. And so that's not one of the challenges that we'll have in the coming months and years, and it's something that the governor wants us to start thinking about immediately. Uh, Secretary Williamson. Great. Um, the out-of-state total at the start of the day in terms of our displaced citizens is up to 66,213. We have approximately 51,000 displaced citizens in state shelters and 1,600 in special needs shelters. 
In addition to that, you are likely all familiar that we have now administered the Emergency Food Stamp Benefit Program since Friday and have over 90,000 applicants certified to receive those emergency food stamp benefits with the average benefit amount being about $370 per applicant. What we have recognized is that our citizens who have had to wait in um, extensive lines, the, our response time is not quick, quick, as quick as it should be. Um, therefore, we've recognized that the infrastructure of our technology leads me to make the decision that beginning tomorrow, we will only accept applications from 6, beginning at 6 a.m. until midnight. And then for the six hours between midnight and 6 a.m., the offices will still be open. What we'll be doing is processing the applications and allowing the data to run through the technology system. So I do want you all to know that we will be sending a message to our citizens that um, out of respect to their time and our intention to become more efficient, that um, the public access to the offices will be from 6 a.m. to 12 midnight, beginning tomorrow. We just want to increase the efficiency and the responsiveness of our process and believe that this will enable us to do so with technology capacity to, um, to process that. Okay, thank you. Uh, tonight we also are joined by Senator Ben Nevers uh, because communications have been devastated in, in uh, Washington Parish. We've had a little to report, but Senator Nevers can give a little bit of a report as to uh, uh, the situation there uh, over the last week and, and how it's looking today. Senator? Thank you, Andy, and certainly uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to my fellow legislators. Uh, communication has been non-existent in Washington Parish. Uh, last time I really spoke to the legislators was Sunday night prior to the storm in our last conference call. Washington Parish is devastated. It is uh, timber on almost every home. Uh, it's been almost impassable from the rural areas to get to hospitals to uh, some of the staging areas where some of the uh, supplies have been sent in. In my opinion, FEMA has failed the rural portions of Louisiana uh, in a manner that's not acceptable. Day seven, and I'm speaking of today, I have two parish presidents that have yet to meet with a FEMA representative. They have not talked to a FEMA representative in seven days. Totally unacceptable. Uh, I've met with FEMA, and they are flying in tomorrow to, to meet with these gentlemen. But I'll say to you that the governor's office, her administration, has worked with me uh, hand in hand trying to get help to our people. If it was not for the private citizen across this great country and corporate individuals that stepped up to the plate, they would be hundreds of people dead in Washington Parish, I can tell you right now. The LSU hospital system done a tremendous job under very adverse situations. We had to take two local pharmacists, put them in the LSU hospital, and try to open up a pharmacy with security surrounding the area. They actually filled 800 prescriptions in about eight hours. And I'm talking about medications that people had to have to, to live. No, non, no narcotic drugs prescribed, and it was advertised that they would not be. And when I say advertised, the only means of communication we have is word of mouth. I've traveled to Baton Rouge almost every night to bring messages here. It just seems unbelievable that in a world that we live in today with so much technology that we can't communicate. The only communication we have in Washington Parish is a ham radio between here and Bogalusa. But I simply say that if it was not for the governor's office and her administration working with Washington Parish and Northern Tangipahoe, I think there would be hundreds of people dead today that, that will survive. Things are getting better. There has been a small amount of electricity restored to the hospital and sewage treatment plant in Bogalusa and some in Tangipahoe Parish. The uh, people are coming into our area. 
Uh, FEMA will be there tomorrow. They assured me that. The Red Cross is there. There are people from all over the United States that responded to a plea that we made over WWL radio. Uh, there's a sheriff from Massachusetts, which the governor's office sent to us. He had, he had called the governor's office and asked who, where they might could go to, do, to help people. He brought 22 uh, deputies with him in a command center, state-of-the-art command center. And what a sight that was to be rolling into Washington Parish to help those people. The sheriff's department was, was in tears. The National Guard has beefed up its troops. They have about 180 troops in Washington Parish now, and around 200, a little better than 200 in Tanchpahoe. Security was a problem. I think we're overcoming that situation. We did have one uh, a convenience store that was looted and burned to the ground the night we were over here looking for security. It's been a very, very uh, tough situation. Communication being, I guess, the worst uh, nightmare that any of us have faced. I cannot talk to my parish president even within the parish. Uh, it's just unbelievable. Satellite phones don't work. Uh, I mean, it's just unbelievable about, you know, trying to communicate. But I say uh, to all of you, uh, we can be proud of our governor and our staff because they come through for the rural area of Louisiana, and I hope we never forget it. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Senator, and uh, we know you've gone through a, Everybody in the area has gone through a tough time. We appreciate your sharing your experience with us. One other thing, and I, I need to bring to all of you, all of you's attention, is we have many people in Louisiana that have food stamp cards. Right now, where you have no power or no phone lines, or where you have power and no phone lines, no one will take those cards. So we have people out there with no cash, no way to get food, and we have to find a way to address this situation. Uh, these people in the poor communities that, that actually uh, have no other means of income other than, than taking a food stamp card and going to the grocery store and getting uh, food for their, their family, uh, that's non-existent in northern Tadpole and Washington and maybe parts of St. Helena and maybe some in northern St. Tammany. While we are having power restored, the phone systems will follow maybe a week or two or three behind that. So we're still going to have that problem. So I'm asking uh, Secretary Williamson if maybe she could find some way to deal with this situation quickly. So if we can get a handle on that, I think we can begin to uh, uh, at least restore uh, some confidence in the system and, and allow these people to get to uh, some facilities that they can get the proper nutrition and proper health care uh, provided to them. Thank you. Thanks, Senator. Uh, Secretary Williamson, uh, sure. do you have any comments on that? Sure, to everyone and especially to Senator Nevers, thank you so much. What my intent is is to immediately reach out to uh, the Food and Nutrition Services of the USDA who are um, clearly equipped with a commodities program, a national commodities program. That means what we can do um, short of the technology challenges is get trucks of dr food and drinks to, to the citizenry and uh, avail our offices to be a distribution point. We can go to shelters and um, ensure that those citizens, well, the shelters, of course, are being, you know, um, those that are suitable. But for all of you, if you feel that your community's citizenry is being um, shortchanged in terms of getting their food and nutrition needs met, I welcome you to bring that to my attention either via email or my cell phone, 931-9394, and let me know about that. How does that sound? Well, it certainly sounds uh, very good, other than the fact that many of these people have no transportation from, from the small communities into uh, one of the sites that, that you might man. We have to find a way to get these, these services out into their community. They have no gasoline. There's a 10-gallon there's a ration on gasoline in Washington Parish, and, and most of the time there's a, there's a line at least three-quarters to a mile long to get to the gas station. Many people never make it there before the gas station runs out of fuel. That is another critical need, and in, in Washington and in northern Tanzania is, is gasoline. Uh, the facts are... Ten gallons uh, is not much fuel when, if you're lucky enough to have a generator at home to try to run it, and, and uh, if you think about uh, what you'd have left 
uh, after running that generator, uh, you wouldn't have enough really to get anywhere. So I would hope we could move those goods out into the rural areas. Even maybe through churches? Or? Whatever it takes, we, uh -huh. we have to do it. Thank you. Thank you. I also wanted to point out something, uh, Senator Nevers. Uh, for those of you who, who aren't in Washington Parish, you might have wanted that communications truck. The process was we did get the call in the governor's office. I called Colonel Doran, who just walked in, and said we got a communications truck and 18 uh, sheriff's deputies from Massachusetts, and uh, they're looking to help. Where are they most needed and where you got requests? And Colonel Doran said, well, we need communications in Plaquemines and St. Bernard's, but then it's not a communications boat, it's a truck. So that means Washington Parish is the, is the place that needs it. So, uh, so that's the way the process works. And I might uh, say, we, we do coordinate that so that it's not a random decision right. up here by the governor's office. We try to get help to whoever needs it based on the advice that we're getting from the folks uh, in the field. And I might say the sheriff himself came from Massachusetts. He represents a county that has 1.4 million people in it. <laughs> he actually came and is staying in Washington Parish. Uh, or at least a week. Great. So, Let me put a guy, huh? Thank you. Uh, the final report I think we got tonight, uh, the governor asked, uh, uh, the governor of Virginia, Governor Mark Warner, asked his chief of staff, uh, Bill Lighty, to come uh, help us. And Bill volunteered to come down here and help the people of Louisiana and the governor of Louisiana for the, last, uh, for the, for the next two weeks. And uh, in three days, He's only had one night's sleep since he's been here. The guy's done an incredible job, and, and last night he was helping try to get replacement firefighters for the fire departments in the affected areas, and, and I wanted to give uh, Bill an update on, on the progress of that effort that the governor asked him to, to uh, get involved in. <clears throat> Thank you, Andy. Um, yes, and Governor Bronco uh, was uh, particularly concerned about the firefighter replacement, the amount of hours people that have been working down there, and I'm, I'm very pleased to report um, that as of uh, uh, about 5 o'clock today, we had 87 uh, New Orleans Fire Department rescue workers and EMS uh, workers uh, over at the Belmont. And, uh, Colonel, I have to give uh, quite a uh, tip of the hat to Lieutenant Fudge uh, because although we were able to secure uh, air transport to get them uh, out and air transport to get 40 uh, replacement workers in, uh, Lieutenant Fudge found a vacant hotel and turned it into a habitable place uh, in a matter of hours today with the, with food, lodging, got the air conditioning turned on, got a crew in there to clean it up, and to top it all off, I don't know how he pulled this off, he had a crew from here in Baton Rouge there to welcome them when they got off the buses and to have a party for them and celebrate. It was quite, quite an event. I went over there myself. Uh, we also facilitated last night and literally all night long until about 3.30 this morning uh, 350 uh, firefighters from New York, uh, fire department in New York, that flew in today into downtown New Orleans. Uh, Lieutenant Fudge uh, also handled a lot of the ground arrangements for this. Uh, they did fly in, and the 350, uh, we also brought out 350 officers from downtown, uh, firefighters from downtown. They're over at LSU at the gym. You need to understand all these firefighters are getting in-depth counseling, debriefings. They're getting mental health counseling. They're getting uh, shots. Uh, they're getting medical uh, attention as well, and all of that was arranged uh, through the uh, through your guard, sir. And uh, we do appreciate it. And I know I don't want to undermine any of the work that the the other organizations that were touched on in pulling all of this together. The Red Cross arranged for the, the food and uh, lodging and uh, uh, the cots and things. Uh, and I'm also pleased to report that about two to three hours away, uh, we are um, also going to be receiving 600 firefighters from Illinois. Uh, that uh, bring in their own equipment, self-contained. They got their own full fuel truck. Uh, they've been moving, uh, moving on their way down, and they're driving nonstop. Um, we also uh, do right now. My next task after this meeting over is over. I've got 50 St. Uh, Bernard uh, Parish uh, firefighters. I've got to get out here very, very shortly. Thank you. Uh, finally, we've got uh, a new uh, gentleman joining us who's given Plaquemine Parish reports from time to time. We got a a little bit of a Plaquemine Parish report from Colonel Doran, who is down there today, but uh, Councilman Cormier, you can give us a wrap-up on uh, anything from Plaquemine today. Yeah, I was able to go ground zero today. I've seen aerial pictures. We will be opening up Bell Chase and Jesuit Bend in two or three days for residents to come back. That's the good news. The bad news is from Diamond on down, it's total destruction. I'm not talking water damage. I'm talking houses reduced to kindling. 
So uh, we will need every ounce of federal and state assistance that we can possibly get. Thank you. Thank you for that report. That's some tough news. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, again, the conference call, this is the last conference call. Uh, tomorrow we will have folks, uh, I will be calling different folks to, to give uh, phoned-in reports at their convenience, which will be accessible uh, online at www.leader.com forward slash LAGov. We're also going to have to come up with a phone number uh, that you can call in if you don't have computer access that you can listen to those reports uh, that way uh, because uh, that, that way you'll be able to listen to them at your convenience and we'll be able to deliver the information more timely and uh, at uh, more convenient times for all of us. Again, uh, thank everybody here. Uh, we're continuing to make progress. Uh, today marks another day of uh, significant progress in, in what's going to be a very, very long effort for Louisiana uh, to, to bring our families back together, to unite them, uh, mourn those, uh, the, the many who have perished and find them uh, and, and give them uh, a respectful uh, uh, recovery process, which is underway, uh, particularly in the, in the uh, most affected areas and uh, in New Orleans. And uh, that, I will sign off, and uh, we will hopefully see you all very shortly. Bye-bye.